how you doing? Good evening. Good evening, Carolyn. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. So I just want to say hello to everyone in the audience tonight on the live streaming platforms. Hey, how's it going? Uh, my name is Carolyn Duby. I'm a principal solutions engineer and the lead cybersecurity SME at Cloudera. And I have with me here tonight my colleague, Greg Blears, who is an expert on data governance and um, and visualization, which are two great topics. Now, I'm going to give you a little rant on data governance before we get started. So everybody loves data. Everybody thinks it's super cool to make decisions about, about, um, about things based on your data. But if your data is not good, if you don't have confidence in your data, you can't make great decisions with it, right? So it's all about the data. It's all about making sure that it's secure, making sure that you understand where it came from, where it's going to, how you're protecting it, what needs to be protective, what's sensitive, and who can have access to it. So Greg is going to walk us through that tonight. He's also going to show us um, some ideas from visualization as well, which is really great um, to be able to take the data that you have that's great data and also be able to make some meaningful visualizations that can help people understand more about the problem that they're trying to solve or um, you know, surface some interesting, actionable insights. So welcome, Greg. Um, it's great to have you here tonight, and I'm really excited about your topic. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, I'm excited as well. Uh, glad to be here. Um, but I think we have a, a couple of questions before we get started uh, for the- for Yes, the yes. So we want to know who's in the audience, so, you know, Give us a shout out in the chat section of the platform that you're listening from. We're, we're um, live streaming from three different platforms tonight. Um, live streaming is always fun because anything can happen, right? And it probably will happen. Um, but anyways, uh, we want to know what, is, what do you think is the best movie of all time? And Greg wants to know why is it Caddyshack? Now for me, I... Um, I am, you know, thinking about Bill Murray because I myself have a gopher in my yard and he is getting very, very bold. He comes up on my back, my back patio, but he does eat the weeds. So I'm not sure, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm letting him, I'm letting things go for now. But, um, you know, if he starts making holes in my yard, it might not be good. So uh, take it away, Greg. Excellent. <laughs> Tell us about yourself. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So, uh, Greg Blears, I'm a peer of Carolyn's. I'm a solutions engineer at Cloudera. I've been in tech for 27 plus years professionally, but it all started when I was about 10 years old and my parents brought home a Texas Instruments 99-4A. That was when uh, that was my, when my future was determined for me. Um, <clears throat> I've spent quite a bit of time in analytics, in the business intelligence world, and uh, I'm really have been very excited in the nearly two years I've been at Cloudera to kind of marry together some of my background experience with the myriad of data sources and the complexity that that potential amount of data uh, brings to solving problems. And so I think tonight, tonight will be a good example of the setup of the problem uh, as well as how CDP solves it. And we're actually going to walk through some things live and, and show you how and, and why. So be I'm very, very excited for it. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, I also want to let you know that we have some fabulous door prizes that we have in stock here. We have all sorts of awesome stuff, shirts and bags and um, uh, I don't know, other sorts of awesome stuff. And, but you know, you got to do a little work, you know, there's really no such thing as free runs, right? So um, you got to do a little work, you got to ask some questions in the chat, you got to participate. Uh, and then at the end, we will be picking a name. Um, and if your name is picked, then you need to send an email to our social media team, and they will send this right off to you. So there's two separate packages. Uh, best of luck to everyone. This is awesome stuff. As you can see, I'm wearing my Cloudera Pride shirt. 
Um, I'm very happy to say that Cloudera has some really has really stepped up its game in diversity and inclusion of all types. Um, I'm on the leadership committee for the women's erg, but we have a pride erg. We have a, um, uh, an erg for for folks with um, different abilities, um, as well as veterans. So it's a it's a very diverse and inclusive place. Uh, you can check out our website. We have some blogs on diversity and inclusion. So um, I also want to let you know uh, that we do have some upcoming meetups coming up. So, um, you know, keep, keep an keep a eye on our page and, um, you know, we'll have our, our uh, upcoming meetups and keep an eye on the page, sign up. You can also, if you have friends that want to watch this later, they'll be up on the, on the live streaming page. So I think I've done enough talking for the night. I get to um, sit back, help with questions, um, and just have a good time. And Greg is going to be doing all the work. So take it away, Greg. Wonderful. Thank you, Carolyn. Appreciate it. Um, as I mentioned in my intro, we're going to talk about just to keep it pretty straightforward and pretty loose. Uh, ask questions about anything that you want about the about the presentation, about the demo. Uh, but we're going to talk about the complex tool set chaining problem, um, meaning how do we stitch together, or what does it mean when you have to stitch together multiple different platforms that represent the different types of data that you require to bring to an analytical problem? Um, and how we solve it with CDP, how our, our R&D has come up with, I think, a pretty unique solution in the space to, to reduce that complexity and the time it takes to get from ideation to uh, an application or a visualization or dashboard or reporting in, in production. Uh, and we'll walk through a little bit of the platform and some of the, the key components that allow us to, to solve these kinds of complex problems. And then we're going to wrap up with a question and answer, answer session. All right, very good. So let's go ahead and uh, let's get started. <clears throat> All right, so what, what we say at, at Cloudera is that we believe that data can make um, what's impossible today possible tomorrow. And so why try to do impossible things? Uh, what do we hope to accomplish? Well, uh, the example we're gonna walk through today, um, number one, saves lives, saves thousands of lives all the time. Um, it also can save companies, right? Saving the bottom line, uh, increasing revenue, reducing cost, um, finding out the unknowable, right? Uh, but really, I think what, what inspired me most about the, doing this session is that I get to talk about something that's real, um, that's won awards for actually saving lives. And that, that is called the St. John's Sepsis Agent. Um, this was something that Cloudera and Cerner won an award for in 2017. Um, and, and let me just walk through a little bit about what happens and, and why it's such a, a challenging problem. So sepsis, as, as most of you probably know, is something that, um, that sets in in various different situations when patients are hospitalized or when they're wounded on a battlefield, um, or if somebody is an in injured and, and maybe gets uh, an infection in a wound, or post-surgery, uh, post-surgical infections. So what, um, what has to be done in, in those cases is there is sort of a, a crash of systems within the patient, and there's also a crash of resources within hospital. Uh, they bring everyone to this emergency to try to, to save the patient. Uh, but in the past, in, in many cases, it was something that was last minute. It was difficult to detect um, you know, whether a patient was septic until it was extremely obvious. And the goal with the St. John sepsis agent was to be able to um, get some early warning. Uh, you know, so what it requires is a combination of live data where you're constantly monitoring uh, what are the patient's vital signs? Um, if you look at the starting from left to right, 
so there's a, an existing patient in a care setting and they're looking at things constantly like temperature. Is it within an acceptable range? Um, <clears throat> heart rate, um, you know, resting rate. If they're looking at blood sugar levels and so forth. And that information has to be constantly flowing through uh, to be able to monitor. And then they're going to do some lookups, uh, checks on levels within that data. And they'll make some decisions uh, based on the readings, based on the readings and the levels. And if it meets specific criteria, or let's start with if it doesn't, they go back to the continuous monitor. So the data is always flowing, right? So you need a live component um, with lots of data. May not be all that challenging for one patient at a time, but if you think about dozens, hundreds uh, of patients or thousands uh, across a, a hospital system, um, simultaneously needing that level of monitoring, you start to get to, to some real, real data volumes. Um, if there's a criteria met, then they want to do a, a set of lookups. Uh, so you have to do a, a report that's going to look back 30 hours to figure out if there's been some uh, organ dysfunction. And then they're going to look at, um, based on, on other levels, they might only look back at 12 hours. So you kind of have to have these, uh, these queries ready to go at a moment's notice and be able to get the results really rapidly because then you go to another decision-making level where you're checking uh, different readings, different lab tests, uh, different levels within, um, within the blood. And you're looking for, again, increases, decreases, uh, values that are out of threshold. And, and then you're going to do some other checks. Um, and based on that, back to the continuous monitoring um, or do uh, another lookup. So they're looking for different criteria. Um, if they're still OK, then continuous monitoring. Otherwise, fire out alerts and let's get some resources from within the hospital to come and take a look at this patient. Right. So very com complex solution requires a mix of, of live or real time data, of historical data, um, you know, both both near term term and farther back. And it's a it's a constantly flowing kind of almost spaghetti uh, code of, of lookups going here and there and everywhere. But the good news is, you know, it's it's uh, it's achievable and it's actually saving lives every day. So we're pretty proud of that. Um, but let's look at an example of, of why data is important and why data governance is important and something that's maybe a little more relevant to the everyday user, um, whether it's a decision maker who needs to, to make a call on whether to change business operations or business models, if it's a data engineer who needs to get uh, get a handle on all the data that's incoming and make it ready and available for business analysts who then have to take it and and study it and turn it into uh, turn it into visualizations that can help support decision makers process. So we'll start with the the life of a of a single analytics project, and we'll use that to do, to explore the complex tool set chaining problem. All right, now. In any kind of project life cycle or, or analytics life cycle, you're going to have some phases that you walk through um, from, from start to finish. Uh, you may call these phases different things, but we'll take one, um, one example here where it starts with a request on the left-hand side here. So there's a request, and the first part of that is to go get data. And it could be coming from numerous different sources. Um, as we talked about in the example at the outset, uh, sometimes there's a, an immediacy um, in the need. So availability of data right away is, if it's there, is sometimes more valuable than, than the moment uh, after that need passes. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that, uh, that FASB is actually developing standards for the depreciation of data. Uh, what is the value of data? Uh, what is it? What's the value um, when it's immediately needed versus you know once that need has expired? So it's not just healthcare. Um, the whole world is thinking about data in different ways. But I digress. So there's a request: go get me some data, please. Right? And so you might have a uh, data engineer, and they're going to do some query extracts and maybe assemble the data into uh, 
some form of staging repository, um, and they may hand it off to a data specialist who's going to then um, deconstruct the data. They may take the raw copy and put it in a form that's more optimal for reporting or analytics, and they may marry it up with other sources, uh, create joins or, or enrich or enhance the data in, in some way. Uh, then hand it off to a data analyst who's going to add further value on top of that. They may apply business logic um, and specific rules or filters based on a person's role within the project team or role within the company. Um, so with the end users in mind, they may say that certain areas are protected. Um, if you're in HR, you may see different levels of data than if you're in finance, for example. <clears throat> And increasingly today, um, there are data scientists and data science teams involved in a lot of analytics projects. So they may take some of that same data and build models. And they want to provide additional analytics um, points for the decision makers. Uh, level of confidence, right? Where is this, where's this value expected to go and how sure are we of that? Um, or, or derive new information completely from a combination of all the data they've been handled or, or been handed. Then finally, it'll go to someone like a business analyst who will actually create the dashboards and the reports or the apps for people to interact with and then pass it off to the consumer or decision maker, right? So now they got, they've got what they asked for, uh, hopefully in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, the problem still exists. The business conditions are still the same on the, on the ground. And she can now make the best supported, the, the best decision possible supported by good data. Now, if these are multiple systems uh, involved all the way through all these phases of the project, <clears throat> what we see here in red represent transfer points. Now, that could be a transfer of data from uh, one database system or enterprise application system to another. So you're handing off data uh, from one system to another. Better make sure all the security policies are in place to be able to move that from, from one place to the next. Uh, it could be outside data sources uh, that have to be scrubbed or cleaned before they're cleared to, to enter one of your, your, uh, one of your resident systems. Some of these may represent knowledge transfer. Um, so from one role to the next, you're not only handing data from one system to another, but you're giving instructions, you're giving education, you're giving knowledge or otherwise information about what was done um, and how that might be used or useful or what the requirements were that you followed to, to pass along that information. Um, <clears throat> but what's notable is every one of these red points now represents risk because if the consumer changes their mind, um, or if the business requirements change, business conditions change, or um, an urgent need arises to um, cause the request, the original request to be modified, you may have to go back and go flow through that entire complex chain of events and handoffs and knowledge transfers and, um, you know, that could create uh, pretty significant time delays um, in a lot of projects. In my past uh, career in, in business analytics, I recall a customer saying that this complex tool set chaining problem uh, resulted in, in one case where they asked for a dashboard to be created and there were some changes made along the way, some, um, some new information came out and in the six months it took to finish the project, um, the need was no longer there, right? So pushing time, uh, time and deadlines back um, could also lead to, to wasting money and resources on, on building these projects. So how do we fix that problem? Um, and what would be great is if rather than handing off from system to system, if you had capabilities to keep the full phases of the project or the full data life cycle of the project on one platform, so you've got all of your ingest capabilities and you've got cataloging capabilities that will 
allow you to see what have I ingested? Where did it come from? Um, <clears throat> and then you've got a platform that allows you to do all the work that you need to in terms of enrichment, enhancement of the data, marrying up data sets, doing joining it and everything else, um, all the way through um, engines that are optimized for uh, handling the load of, of queries and requests once the applications are built, um, incorporating that entire flow into uh, data science activities and, and machine learning and AI. Um, and then giving the, the, uh, the end user an interface built into that same platform. Um, that's going to eliminate the handoffs, the transfer of, of the data across different applications, different platforms, different systems, if it's full data lifecycle. Um, and it just so happens that, that Cloudera does have capabilities that handle the full data lifecycle. Um, but what's most important about the, the full data lifecycle capabilities is that there is a common security and governance layer across all phases of that project. So you don't have to go to one interface to secure a table um, and another one to secure a visualization and another one for an operational database or for, um, for finding out what the policies are on uh, ingest of data. So it saves a lot of rework and it gives you an enterprise view into not only what data you have um, in the form of catalogs, which we'll, we'll walk through in the demo, but also into what the policies are that have been created, as well as what is the what are the access patterns? Who has accessed this data? Were they supposed to? Um, and are they, you know, are we running into any consistent requests that are being denied based on the policies that we've set up to protect our data and our, our um, intellectual capital? Um, another, another brief thing to add here. So because we've spent the, you know, the time and effort of engineering this full data lifecycle platform with this universal security layer, our SDX layer, it makes it possible for us to operate within your data center, uh, an on-premise cluster, um, in hybrid mode, uh, in a combination of uh, on-premise data center, data center activity and cloud, as well as in, in multi-cloud uh, mode. So if you're using uh, our partners like Amazon or Azure or Google Cloud, if you decide to move a workload from the on-premise footprint, to the cloud, you don't have to reauthor all the security. Um, the security, the metadata, the policies, and everything else will follow the data um, using our tools to migrate from, from on-premises to cloud. All right, so let's walk through um, some of these pieces. I'm not gonna walk through and build an entire project end-to-end -end life data life cycle. That's for a, a much longer, uh, long form program some other day. Right. What I really want to focus on is um, is governance, as well as the the visualization, and show um, a couple of basic policies. You know, how does a person navigate around the system with with that much data and that variety of sources? Um, what what an approach would be uh, to to secure that data, and then finally, what will it look like in terms of uh, visualizing that data? So. We're not going to focus on all of the roles, um, but we will touch on concepts that affect many of the different uh, team members in, a, in an enterprise that would, uh, that would benefit from that kind of full life cycle project. Um, so we'll go into a, a special focus on reporting. Um, but as I mentioned, we will uh, we'll do kind of a, a flyby of, of all the rest of it. Again, this is what, uh, what inspired me to, uh, to, to do the meetup. Wanted to talk about the uh, complex tool set chaining uh, problem, Cloudera's approach to, to solving that problem with a special emphasis on governance uh, as well as visualization. So with that, um, I think we'll launch into the demo unless there are um, 
Any questions before we jump in? Carolyn, anything coming in from the field before we uh, hop into it? Um, we have a few questions, but I think we'll um, maybe we should go on a little bit and then address them at the end. Okay, excellent. Well, let's do that, and um, you can be time cop for me if I start to get uh, get long in my my presentation or in my my demo. So let's jump into it. <clears throat> um, all right, so what, what we're seeing now is the home screen. Um, you can see that I'm already logged in. We use a, a single sign-on mechanism, so when I access this, um, I'm, I'm authenticated and authorized here. I see my name, my username here, and I'm presented with what I'm allowed to see. Um, that, that's step one, right, in, in good governance and security. And where I might start is, is here in the, the management console. So within our control panel, we'll be able to see environments that are available. Um, right now, we've got this environment pretty, pretty well locked down. Uh, I'm, I'm the only one in the world using it right now. Um, you know, in a production environment, you might see icons all over the planet uh, that might represent um, environments that we've built in AWS or Azure or Google um, or, or data center uh, based environments as well. Um, within, this, within this environment, there are a lot of different capabilities and we'll walk through them um, as we progress in the demo. But one of the places I'm going to start out is within the data warehouse that I've configured for this particular environment. <clears throat> And you'll see that my data warehouse has timed out and stopped. Good thing I started there first, because uh, I can start it up. But that brings up a, a really good point. Uh, so this is running on AWS, um, our, our, our great partner, uh, cloud infrastructure provider. So we, we're running our, our public cloud version of CDP. And one of the things I wanted to point out um, is basically just been, been shown here for me. So when we create a, a virtual warehouse, um, <clears throat> what we're really doing is bringing functionality to where your data resides. You'll see this in just a, just a little bit. Um, you're gonna put your data wherever you wanna put it, um, in, be it in Azure, or Google, or AWS. And what we're doing is overlaying functionality and capabilities on top of that. So this particular, um, virtual warehouse represents compute resources that you can use for Hive queries, for Impala queries, uh, building apps that are going to use those as, as a back end. But we are, um, in addition to governance in the traditional sense, in the security sense, we've also put a lot of thought into cost governance. Since I wasn't using this compute resource, rather than having the, the compute meter running nonstop, it went ahead and timed out for me. So while this is starting up, I'm going to go back over to, um, instead of going to the home screen, <clears throat> I'm going to start in the data catalog. So let's say I'm tasked with one of the various roles um, within, the, within the team, and I want to find out what kind of data is out there, right? Um, you know, do I have what I require to get started? Uh, maybe I'm looking for physician uh, data. Um, and I can see there's a bunch of different entities that are created here. Uh, or maybe it's patient data. And I start typing and I can see I've got a table and several different columns that are, are defined. Um, if I'm looking for something like you know, hospital data, um, I can see Again, I've got a couple different, uh, I've got a table on a, on a couple different columns that are, are defined here. So where is this data coming from? Where is this information coming from? Well, I've, uh, <clears throat> I've gone in and um, just uploaded about a year's worth of records from an entire state um, of, of data around, um, you know, full spectrum of medical conditions and, and hospital visits. And basically just loaded it up into S3. Um, we've got 
uh, our CDP public cloud running in, uh, in an environment there. And as this data comes in, uh, I then went and created a couple of tables uh, or a series of tables um, that are pointing to that S3 location. So we've got profilers that are running and say, okay, uh, something was done. I've got data. Um, let's make a note of that, right? Let's add that uh, to, to the catalog. Or, hey, look, a table was made. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and catalog that. Um, I've actually joined a couple tables together or created a, a materialized view, and that will be represented in here as well. So to take a look at, at some of the level of information that's captured, um, I'm going to go ahead and select things that I've created that I own. And let's take a look at one of these tables. So this uh, metrics pair is actually a view. And I can see that in the properties, um, you know, things like number of columns, which uh, data like it is attached to, who's the owner, when was it created, uh, last access, that type of thing. I can see that the type is a virtual view. Um, it's in the default database. Um, and then as I start going down the screen here, I can see the, uh, what I think is interesting is the lineage. Um, I mentioned earlier that your data goes to where you want it in your cloud infrastructure provider. So if I look at the, at the origin point here on metrics, I can see that this is in an S3 bucket, right? We don't take your data and ingest it somewhere so that we can do things to it. And I think that's a key differentiator out there in, in the marketplace. There's a lot of solutions that that will, um, you know, promise all kinds of great things and give you some some good performance and functionality if you let them take your data, right? Um, but we don't make you do that. Put your data where you want, and we'll figure it out from there. And so um, from that starting point, I can see that there was a little further down the line. There was this metrics table created. And so I see that this is a, a Hive table, um, who the owner is, uh, what the qualified name is. Again, some of the similar information that we saw in the, uh, the asset details there. Created, last access, et cetera. Same thing with payer. Um, so payer was, uh, <clears throat> was created. See that same information. And then metrics payer, if I click on that, um, so this is the that virtual view uh, that was created, and I can see that the lineage, uh, um, you know, shows me what that view was built on top of. It was as a result of joining the metrics and payer tables together uh, to create that. All right. So um, some other information here we can see schema, and again, all of this automatically populates. I didn't have to enter any of this or create any of this. Uh, it gets generated for me behind the scenes. I can see uh, some audit information. So when was it created? Was anything modified or changed over time? I can see here is a, you know, for our, our data engineers and our security people, um, you know, what are the, what are the policies that are enabled against this asset? So I can see that there are some, uh, <clears throat> there's a, uh, a couple of policies that will affect who can do what um, to this particular asset. And that there's an interesting one here that'll come into play later called PII, especially in the healthcare uh, scenario. Personally identifiable information is something that might be important to protect and, and either mask or, or um, otherwise obscure. And then lastly, here we have the access audits. Great to know who's using this data, who's accessing it, or uh, better yet, who's attempting to access it. Um, uh, Carolyn happens to be our, our resident cybersecurity expert on, on my team. And uh, I'm sure that um, she's very glad to have this kind of visibility into who's accessing a system. Um, so this is something very helpful as well. All right. Now, how does this catalog get populated? What do we do with this data um, you know, once we have this kind of information? Well, let's go back to... Um, Let's go back to see how our, our data warehouse is doing. It looks like we're running here and I can see um, at a high level the resources that are being used. 
And I can do things like open up our data visualization. So data visualization um, <clears throat> is something that we've incorporated into the platform. And it, it helps with, um, I think, in, in valuable checkpoints uh, at each phase along the way. Um, if, you're, if you're done with your work and you can connect and create a quick visualization to see what are my data assets that I just created look like, or post modeling or joins, uh, what does the data look like, or um, even, even building different applications or reports or dashboards for the, the business analysts. So let's do that for, let's start with that data look first. As I go into the data tab, I can choose if I have multiple database or, or, or connections here, I can choose which one I wanna look at. I can see that I've got 14 data sets created. That's kind of the second part. Uh, where I start is the connection explorer. So these are the assets that actually exist within that uh, particular database. And so I can select one of them. Um, I can click on this uh, diagnosis table and I can see some high level information about it. I can see here that there's one data set created um, based off of that. I can then look at sample data. So if I'm done with my phase of the project and I wanna see, all right, well, what does it look like, right? I can get a, a, a nice quick view here of, of what that looks like. I can also see some table statistics, uh, number of rows, how many files it's based off of, size on disk, et cetera, um, even column statistics. Um, so for, for all of the, uh, the columns in the table. And then lastly, whether or not there's been a, a data set created against this particular uh, asset. And I can see that there was one created, what time it was created, who it was modified by, and whether there are any visuals that are, that are built uh, against it. So uh, kind of a brief overview of, of looking at data. Um, let's go to one of these data sets. And you'll, you'll notice that I can click on I can click on this icon here to create a new dashboard, um, but I'm gonna go, yeah, why not? Let's do, like Carolyn said, it's live. Let's see if we can uh, run into some interesting situations, right? Um, so so uh, I think the producers are sweating in the background. Sorry, George. Um, let's start with, uh, with something like uh, patients. So if I wanna create a, a new dashboard against patients, um, you'll see that it comes up with a, with a canvas here and lots of handy things that I might want to paint onto the canvas. Um, by default, it'll start out with something like a, just a basic table. But what I think is really interesting is either to go into the uh, Explore options and you can start selecting different combinations of columns and it'll give you a choice of which visualization do you think. Uh, it'll give you suggestions actually of the helpful visualization types. But when I wanna get a first look at the data, I think it's a little more interesting to look at these field statistics. And so I'm gonna close these little guys and I'm gonna blow this guy up. And what it's doing is going and looking at all of the table statistics and actually the data and it's gonna generate values. So what type of, of, uh, of data is this? How many distinct values are there? Um, what's the minimum value? What's the ma uh, maximum value? How many nulls are present in this, in this column? And then the last thing it's going to do is paint a little histogram um, in the detail column. There we go. So I can even hover over these and see kind of tool tips on what these different ranges look like. And that's really helpful for me, uh, especially if I'm a, a data analyst or a business analyst. I can do a lot of different things here. I can see, well, does this information look right? Um, is this gonna be what I need to, to do my phase of the project? Uh, do I think this is sufficient to um, answer the question that was originally posed by the decision maker? And I can also get a nice at a glance view um, I'm reassured that I have geo data because maybe I want to do some mapping um, and I can take a scan of this, look at all the fields that are here um, and even get that visual 
it will view that everything is there. Now, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of different values here, like city, uh, county, daylight savings, elevation, um, Hawaiian population. That's an awful lot of information for just a patient table, right? Um, that's because what I've done is added a layer um, <clears throat> of data modeling on top of this particular data set. So in addition to pulling from raw tables, I can come in here and I can say, let's look at that patient table and I'm gonna edit it in a new window. And what it allows me to do is look at the um, data set detail, what dashboards were created against it. I can go into fields and modify them. Maybe if I wanna change the formatting uh, for specific purposes, if I wanna add color coding uh, thresholds. But here, what I wanted to do was join the patient data up to demographics uh, because I knew that I would be looking at that data in context. So all I have to do is go to, to go to any table here and I can uh, edit data model. I can click the plus and I can create a new join on, um, you know, on that particular table. So it actually gave me whatever fields match by name and data type, it's going to give me as possible choices for joins. I eliminated a few because I know that the key and this visit link value and the patient number are all that I require for this particular use case. All right, so let me go back <clears throat> and look back at my visualization. Now, one of the things that I know I'm, I'm going to want to do is, is mask some of this information. And I think in the interest of time, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go back in here and I'm going to take one of my pre-built visualizations in true cooking show style. I'll go back to home and I'm going to look at uh, one of the visualizations that I've already built. So I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at physician charges by patient condition. So it, it, this is looking at the, um, the sum of charges by uh, my top 20 uh, physicians. And in the, in the bars, it represents the, the or, sorry, not patient condition, that, is, that represents the average length of stay. I think I changed that one last night. Uh, so I'm gonna go here and edit, and I wanna take a look at what, uh, what some of the other data would look like. So I'll click on configure, and I wanna go back here to build. And let's say that I wanted to just, um, you know, make it a, a simple table again. And I wanted to change from position and I wanted to look at, um, instead of total charges and length of stay, I wanna look at patient. And I wanna look at uh, something like days between visits. It's important for compensation purposes in the healthcare uh, world that um, patients aren't coming back right away um, with with a problem, uh, you know, based on uh, you know based on something that was supposedly already treated, right? So I want to go here and say um, average, or no, let's just leave it as uh, as maximum, and I refresh the visual. And I, now I see something here, um, my patient number, it looks like I have one patient, right? Uh, that can't be right. Let me add in the physician above that. Refresh the visual. And now I've got my physicians in here. And does every physician have the same patient with number 1111111? No, right? What we've done is we've created a policy to mask the patient number. Um, so what we don't want, we, that's something we've chosen uh, not to expose in this particular report or dashboard. So looking at our data visualization tool and seeing the effects of a policy like that, let's take a moment to go back and see how that happened. I will go back to my environment and I'm going to go home and back to my management console. <clears throat> 
And what, I, what I'll use for, for policies, um, for creating policies that will protect our information, protect our data, um, is a combination of Atlas and Ranger. So Atlas at a, at a high level is something that we can use to create um, tags and descriptions of data that we can then leverage with Ranger to create policies. Um, so when I looked at my data catalog, that was pulling a lot of information from Atlas uh, and some information from Ranger as well when I was looking at the access audit and so forth. Um, let me just jump into Ranger here. <clears throat> And you'll see that when I when I come in, um, I'm presented with choices. What are you looking to secure today? Um, and I'm going to look at Hadoop SQL. And now I can see all of the policies that have been created for the variety of databases and tables and columns and everything else. So these are access policies here. And if I were to look at one of these um, a little closer, I can click on Edit. And I can see the type of policy that it is. Every policy will have an ID um, and a name. You can choose to create labels. Um, this is applied to everything. And then I've got some choices to make. I've got um, um, groups that I can apply. Um, you know, so which groups is this affecting? I can select specific users. And then I can change the collection of permissions. So you can see they've got a variety of things they can do. Um, select, update, create, drop, et cetera. Right? So this is a good one for, for admins and some of the particular um, service users that would be involved in this kind of full data lifecycle project. They need to be able to access think, uh, data entities, um, look at, query them, uh, modify them, delete them, um, you know, if need be. Um, but let's go ahead, uh, just briefly, we can have exclusions as well. We want to say let all these groups or users do all of this, um, but this one particular user might have a slightly different subset or might be denied one particular uh, action. Um, you can also have uh, global deny conditions as well as exclusions from deny conditions. All right, let me cancel there and, and just give you a look at how we mask that uh, PII data, how we mask that patient uh, ID. So I went over here to masking and I created a new policy. And if I look at the edit of that, I gave it a name, I gave it a description, I applied it to a particular database and a particular table and a particular column. And then I came down here and I said, um, on select, I want to redact that field. But there are other options. You know, we can do things like partial masking or hashing, nullify, um, you know, for its date. You don't want to show a lot of times, especially in healthcare setting, um, a combination of factors. Um, any personally identifiable information, um, what date an event happened, because that could be used to find personally identifiable information. Um, and then, of course, uh, any, any kind of monetary values for, um, for those kinds of uh, uh, services. So let me cancel out of here, cancel out of the policy. Um, and then just a, a couple other things that we can do here. Um, in the data catalog, we showed the, the audits by data entity, but there are much more capabilities here. So for all of the policies across all of the components that might be used for a solution like that, it's important to be able to have visibility into all those kinds of things. So you can see there are policies for HBase, policies for Atlas, um, you know, policies for Kafka, uh, um, policies for everything under the hood on the, the Cloudera platform. So from a, from a governance perspective, from the people that are responsible for security and maintaining it, uh, making sure that things are applied appropriately and also making sure that the right people have access to do their jobs. You can see there's, there's a, a wealth of tools available um, for them. All right. Um, how are we doing on time, Carolyn? Are we um, leaving enough time for Q&A after this? 
Um, I think we're doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we should probably wrap up in a couple of minutes and we'll take some questions. Perfect. All right, let's do that. Um, so let me come back here and we will end in the individualization. Um, so not just, uh, <clears throat> you know, this is not just tables and columns and, and rows, et cetera. Um, this is a lot, you know, pretty wide variety of visualizations um, here. So just going through kind of a sample catalog, um, you know, almost anything you can imagine that you need to create, we've got visual capabilities to allow you to do that. Um, you can create things like dashboards, um, which are which are a combination of various different different visualization types, just dragged onto that same canvas that that I showed you. Um, so we've got a, a heat map combined with a couple other components. I'm a big fan of the Sankey diagram to show how phases along a process um, are impacted, you know, by by prior phases or how they uh, impact post phases. Uh, we've got some geo data here reflected on a map. Um, so you know, almost anything you've seen in a in a reporter dashboard can be done with uh, the various kinds of visuals that are here. And then the last thing I'll show just briefly, um, you can also create things like apps. So apps are something that might have its own URL to access. You wouldn't go through um, you know, this interface to, to get access to it. This is something that you want to publish to consumers. They can maybe open it up and, and they can see the data um, or they could maybe have some filtering capabilities to modify or slice and dice a little bit, um, you know, what they're seeing. But it's kind of a bespoke collection of visualizations uh, and data definitions um, within a, an encapsulated uh, component. All right. Well, um, hopefully I didn't talk your ear off or, or power or slide anyone to death here. I think um, what we can do is go on to the Q&A, and then we've got the real exciting uh, uh, stage of the show, the raffles. Hey, great job, Greg. This is like super interesting stuff. I love looking at all the visualizations and governance stuff. Super, super interesting. Uh, so I've got a few questions in the, um, in the forums. But, you know, um, we could always use more questions, so please ask away. Um, I actually have three questions from uh, the username MCCAT, and um, I am a crazy cat lady, so I love the username MCCAT. I have no idea if you like cats, but... Um, <laughs> I have a 21-year-old cat, so I'm, I'm definitely a fan of cats. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so MC Cat would like to know, um, does visualization support active filtering? So I'm not sure what the, what the connotation of active filtering is there, um, but in, you know, can it do maybe parameterized filtering? Um, so yeah, I, I'm not quite sure about that one either. Um, MC Cat, if you can just ask a clarification on that question, uh, not I wasn't quite sure about that one. Um, the other question is, can I set Ranger policies via CLI? Um, sure. I think the, um, you know, it's, it's much more straightforward to do it via, uh, via the UI, um, you know, but almost every component uh, on the platform has uh, an API or SDK and, and, and CLI um capabilities yeah yeah there's a there's a rest there's a rest api but i think um yeah i think like, like greg was saying it's it's probably more straightforward to do it to do it through the ui but it does have a rest api that goes with it so now then i see that I'm, I'm actually on the the question page now that i see mc cat's third third question so can you mask data based on log user info like like country um, I see that uh, if that's what you mean by active filtering, so basically it's taking a parameter from the user's profile or login information uh, and, and build a, a filter 
rather than pre-populating all the information? Um, that is a really good question. And, and I think I haven't personally done it within um, Ranger. I know that data visualization can handle, um, you know, parameter-based filtering. Um, oh, and which is what you asked, is visualization supported? Yes. Um, yeah, so so um, we do, there is a presentation. So with Ranger and Atlas, between the two of them, you can do full GDPR compliance. Um, and so there is a presentation from, it's, it's, mm -hmm. It's, a, it's probably maybe a couple of years old, but um, you know you can do full GDPR with Ranger and Atlas. Um, you can do like row level filtering, uh, masking, um, and then if you pair that with the acid capabilities of something like Hive, then you can um, implement the 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 you know to be forgotten. So you know with these you can definitely do a full GDPR, GDPR compliant. Um, so there was, were there any more questions? Do we want to, um, take any more questions or shall we move on to, uh, to the next item? It's gonna, okay. Okay. I think we are ready to, we are ready to move on. Um, okay. Okay. Very good. So I just want to point out a few resources that we have for you um, on, on the web that you can use to get started. Um, uh, we have our, um, you know, uh, let's see, what have we got here? I'm just trying to see what, which ones we have. Um, but we've got these basic uh, resources that you can go on to learn more about the platform. We'd love to hear from you. Um, in terms of if there's any topics that you want to hear about more in the meetups. Um, this, this series of meetups that we're doing is called the Hello Series. And it's basically introductory topics to different parts of the platform. But, um, you know, we'd love to hear from you about what you want to see in future meetups. Um, our next meetup... Our next meetup is going to be the Future of Data Austin. And um, the topic of that meetup is going to be building automated machine learning workflows in the cloud. Now, this this is probably not uh, this is probably not your basic your basic meetup, um, but I think this is a super interesting topic. Um, it's one thing to build a model. It's another thing to actually bring that model into production and do things like building these models on the cloud. So super interesting topic, June 8th, 2021, 5 to 6 p.m. And that's in Central. That's in the future of da Data Austin. Um, OK, shall we go on? Uh, what do we want to do next year? All right, it's time for raffle. I've been told that it's time for raffle. Yay, this is like the best part. Um, OK. I'm going on to the raffle. <laughs> I just refreshed my page. Um, OK, so I am going to um, go and pick a raffle. Choose a winner. I don't have a choose a winner button. I'm getting, I'm getting, um, there we go. <laughs> um, my, my winner here is MC Cat. So congratulations, MC Cat. Big round of applause. Uh, send your, send your email, uh, your contact information to social media at cloudera.com. And this concludes our meetup. Um, on behalf of the team, I would like to thank everyone. This meetup series is a great collaboration from different parts of the company, uh, not just our solutions engineers behind the scenes. We've got Bill and George and Shelby, um, our social media team and our marketing team, and all the awesome people that helped to make this meetup series work. Um, I want to 
thank you very much for coming out tonight. This is a great topic. And thank, thank you, Greg, for uh, putting in the time to do this presentation. So awesome seeing everyone. Reach out to us. Let us know what it is you want to hear about in these meetups. These are really for you. These are developer advocacy. And we look forward to seeing you in the future. So I hope you have a great night. And this concludes our meetup. We look forward to next time.